The gifts of the Spirit is something that the Holy Spirit comes upon a person to do for a particular task. And then, in a sense, I'm going to say he lifts his hand. Even though he lives within me, the Holy Spirit comes to accomplish something in my life and accomplish something in the lives of other people. And then he stops. Now, we know that happened in the Old Testament. The Bible says the Holy Spirit moved upon Elijah like a rushing mighty wind. So something supernatural happened in his life, and then he left him. The good news is the Holy Spirit lives within us, and as a believer in the New Testament, guess what? He does not come and go. He is, I I am a permanent dwelling place for the Holy Spirit of God. The same Holy Spirit that when uh, Moses put his rod in the, uh, the waters in it, the waters pulled back. It's the same Holy Spirit that rushed through that water and made things stand back. It was that same Holy Spirit that anointed David uh, and brought have him give him the ability to bring Goliath down. That same Holy Spirit that moved upon the apostles as they wrote the scriptures, the Holy Spirit of God moved upon them. That same Holy Spirit now lives within me. But guess what? He wants to come outside of me and love to people and minister to the people around me. My my goal is, is to allow the Holy Spirit to have free course through me, whether it comes to just a word of knowledge for somebody, a word of wisdom for somebody, uh, uh, the gift of faith for somebody, whatever. I want to be a vessel that's always here I am, Lord, use me. That's every day. Not when I feel spiritual on Sunday. Not when I feel spiritual after doing my Bible devotion. It's something that I want to have free. That way, think about Jesus. In the book of John, the Bible says he only did what he's seen his father do. And that's how I want to be. I want to, I want, I want, I want to be able to see what the Father's wanting to do to the world around me. Huh? Don't this world need something given to them other than the same old carnal language and carnal stuff that we got? And guess what? Don't look to the super preacher to think he's the person to do it. Guess who? He wants to work through. You can't bring me to the job site, but you're on the job site. You can't take me young people to the ball field, but guess what? You're on the ball field. So when God gets ready to do something supernatural outside of yourself, you're the vessel at the moment. You're God's secret weapon, in a sense, in society. You've been planted there to be able to do great things. And I want to continue teaching now listen to me, young people. You can wait till you're 50 years old to start doing this, or you can learn to function in it now, and by the time you get my age, you are a pro at listening to the Holy Spirit. So whichever one you want, you can wait till you get older, or you at a young age, and the Scripture tells us not, don't let nobody put you down because you're young. You can begin to operate and flow into the things of the kingdom. Amen? So last week... Uh, Let me just real quick, a word of knowledge. Remember, we talked about a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is when God speaks to you something and gives you a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is when God declares the facts or purpose about the present or the past. God gives you a supernatural revelation about things in the past in an individual's life and gives uh, gives you a word for that, to declare something. A word of wisdom is when God gives you certain wisdom for the present facts or something in the future. God can personally give you wisdom for what he wants to do in the future, or he can speak to you and you can speak to somebody to declare wisdom for the future, okay? And that's for all of us, that can happen with it. That same God that spoke to them to give them the word of God dwells within me, okay? And then we talked about uh, 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 the discerning of the spirits. And we talk about the importance of learning the, of the turning of of the Spirit. Discerning of the Spirit gives you the ability to when you see people preach or you're around. Have you ever been around somebody and you just don't feel comfortable around them? And something's like something's going on. That is the God, the Holy Spirit within you, giving you some discernment to be able to handle. Sometimes it's somebody just in a fleshly attitude. Sometimes yeah, I've been with preachers that I just uh, everybody else was hooping and hollering about them, and I was like, I don't know about that joker. And you find out a little bit later, uh, he fell. I remember one time we was, just real quickly, we was doing the Disciple Now, and there was hundreds of kids there, and everybody was hooping and hollering about him, how awesome he was, and this and that. And something just went sitting right in me. I was just like, we found out later, he's the one that got locked up for when he'd go stay in folks' house. He had put a pen with a camera on it and with video and women 
in their bathrooms and stuff, something, and everybody else was, oh, he thought, I was like, man, something's not right here. All right, so listen to me. The Holy Spirit wants to give you discernment in life. That way you can kind of feel things out that you're having to deal with. Amen? He can do that. And if you would learn to pick up on that, you'd be able to move on, move in in Christ's name. Last week, we talked about the gift of faith. We talked about how God gives us saving faith. Saving faith is when I see what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, and I say, therefore, being justified by what faith? Is I look at what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, and by faith, not by feelings, I accept what he's done for me. So by faith, I receive that. And then there's faith righteousness. God gives me his righteousness. Righteousness, even though I don't feel like I'm righteous, guess what? I am righteous because I have received what? His righteousness. And we talked about if you can't believe those two, it's going to be hard for you to ever believe in the gift of faith. See, if you'll look at yourself and stop being so disgusted and say, God, you know, you made me just the way I am. And therefore, you got something special for me because I carry and bury your image in my life. So stop being so negative and begin to thank God for who you are and thank God can use you. Amen. And then we talked about the gift of faith when God gives you a supernatural conviction about something. It, I mean, it's not just a conviction about truth. It, you may be in the midst of a storm and you there's something in you says, you know what? I'm not going to allow fear to go me. I don't care if there's tornadoes bouncing all around me. I just something in me said it's going to be okay. Everybody else freaking out. There's something in you that says, no, I'm going to do. A supernatural gift of faith might be when God operates through you, you just stand and believe for something that in the natural your natural ability can never see it come to pass. But God gives you something inside you of faith to stand for something that God can only God could do through you, okay? Today we're going to talk about a topic that makes a lot of people nervous, okay? Uh, we're going to talk about the gift of, uh, in the next passage, and we'll read it here in a second. We're going to talk about the gift of healings and the working of miracles. A lot of folks get rowdy when you talk about the gift of faith and the gift of miracles. Now let me just tell you, I am not... Not a miracle worker. The preachers you see on TV are not miracle workers. Can the miracle worker work through me? Yes. Can the miracle worker work through you? See, lots of times folks want you to want you maybe sit and you want to come down to the super preacher. When it comes to the gift of gift of healings and the working of miracles, it's something that God does. It ain't something that I can do. I can stand with you and agree with you about what the Scripture's done. But when it comes to the supernatural movings of the Holy Spirit, God does it. And He does it when He wills to. He does it in His own sovereignty. I don't understand why some are not healed and why some are healed. But when it comes to the supernatural gift of faith, the working of miracles and gift of healings, it is a sovereign work of God. I must be willing to say, I, here I am, Lord, use me. We're going to talk a little bit about on the end, well, if God is God, well, then why do some things happen? Okay? Let's pray right quick, and then we'll get into the Scripture. Father, we love you. We love you for what you've done for us. We trust you. I am blessed, God, to be a pastor. I am blessed to be here with these people. And I pray, just like Paul prayed, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit said in His Word and what He's trying to say to us today. Help me cut the fluff out, God. Let me speak just your truth and your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me go real quickly, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to go into 1 Corinthians 12, okay? Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, starting with verse 1, it says, Therefore, we must give more earnest heed. The word earnest heed there means to turn your mind towards. God's saying, therefore, you need to learn to turn your mind towards something, okay? Turn your mind towards the thing which we have heard, lest we drift away. Look what he's saying. You got to learn. Christianity is about shifting your mind towards the things of the Word of God, because if we ain't careful, we'll let the things that we see in the Word of God to do what? Let them slip away, or the word drift away means to slip away in our mind. So you hear what it's saying? You can read the Word of God tomorrow. And the further you go on through the week, you, the Scripture says you'll begin to forget what you read. 
So it is our job to continually remind ourselves about what's in the Scripture. If we do not remind ourselves about what's in the Scripture or what's in the Word of God, those things will begin to slip away. And let me tell you something. If those things begin to slip away, then I'm only dependent upon myself. And when I'm only dependent myself, we may get a few things right, but we're going to get a bunch of things wrong. All righty. So the Bible says plainly, we must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest they slip away or drift away. For the if the word of God spoken through angels proved steadfast, in other words, when the angels spoke, it stood, you could write it down, it was firm. And every transgression or transgression and disobedience received a just reward. In other words, when they did those things, they re reap what you sow. How shall we escape if we neglect? Now look at this real quickly. When it comes to the things of God, if we don't put our mind towards the things of the Scripture, we will neglect. The word neglect means to be careless. We'll take it. We won't be. We'll be. We'll be careless about life. We won't take things serious. Okay. So if we escape, if we escape, if we. Um, how shall we escape if we neglect or be think, take careless such a great salvation? Hang with me right quick. God has provided salvation to us. God has provided all these things for us. But if we don't turn our mind towards the things that God has done for us, then guess what? Those things will begin to slip away in our life. And then one day you're going to get mad at God and wonder why this Christianity business ain't working. And I'm going to look you in the eye and say, how long has have you looked to the Word of God? Have you been letting those things, the truths you know, begin to slip away and now you've just been out there doing it on your own thing and now because you've been doing your own thing you're mad at God because this Christianity thing's not working for you. And it all started to say, look, don't be careless. It began, don't let your mind slip away. Be regular people who turn your mind towards the things of God. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation which at first be first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who uh, those who heard him, God all be also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with ver various mar miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to the will of God. See, a drifting mind will always result in a careless attitude. Let me read that again. A drifting mind will always result in a careless attitude. Many, and now let's get to the main point of my preaching. Many, when it comes to the supernatural gifts of God, there's a doctrine of what we call cessation. Cessation teaches that the disciples were empowered by the Holy Spirit and they were given the ability to speak in tongues. And they were given the ability to work miracles. They were given the ability to do all that. That way, everybody would watch them, look at them and say, hey, these folks are speaking for God. And they believe that when that proof time happened or the scriptures got what we call inscripturated, when the scriptures were written, that God took those gifts back that they didn't need to, didn't need to take place anymore. I don't believe that. I don't believe when God, because look at me, we live in a crazy world. I happen to think we live in a crazier world than the disciples lived in. So if they needed that, how much more do we need them today? So cessation says when God got finished writing this book, putting this book together, then guess what he did? He stopped all the movings of the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't need the gifts of the Holy Spirit because we got the written word. The good news is the scripture teaches really against that in Jesus' name. Listen to this right here. And this is my point that I always debate people. Why would the gifts be given to various people in the church after the death of Christ? If the gift of the Spirit was only for the disciples, how come he was teaching it to the Corinthians and the Corinthians were abused and he had to come in and reteach them what was going on? If the gifts of the Holy Spirit were only for the disciples, how come the Corinthian church were prophesying, giving word of knowledge, word of wisdom, operating the gift of healings and working in miracles? They were doing it. Why would God leave it, give it to them if it was only for the disciples, number one, okay? Why would Paul say to the Galatians, this right here, listen, Galatians chapter three, verses one through six. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus was, was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith? 
Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you are now made per perfect by the flesh? In other words, the Holy Spirit come in you, completed you, made you righteous and holy. Now you're out there trying to live it on your own and rather, instead of continuing in that lifestyle that got you saved in the first place. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Look what he says here. I therefore, therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you. See, there was miracles going on amongst the Galatian church. Does he do it by works of the law or by hearing of faith? If the gifts of the Spirit, working of miracles, gift of healings, and all these things were done away with, why is it going on in the Galatian church? Why is it going on in the Corinthian church? Why did God anoint a deacon by the name of Philip to do a mighty miracles and stuff. Why? If, if they passed away, why anoint a deacon? I thought deacons were just supposed to serve tables. No, as a born again child of God, the Holy Spirit of God lives within me and will give me the ability to do what I can't do on my own. And every once in a while, if I'll have ears to hear, God will speak to me to declare something for somebody else to be able to bring deliverance in Jesus' name. If you would start believing that. But some of you don't think you're holy enough to be used by God. The good news, you never was holy enough. It is Jesus holy in us. In fact, if you look in the scripture in the Old Testament, he used all kinds of bunch of rascals. I mean, he used David who committed adultery and had a man killed. He used a Jacob who was a deceiver and a subplanter. He was a crazy old bird. God has a tendency to use people that don't trust themselves anymore. They trusted themselves in the world and it got them in big trouble. And now they've learned to totally and to trust in the Holy Spirit of God in Jesus' name. So here we are 2,000 years later. As a pastor, I want to deconstruct stuff that you've been taught. You've been taught some crazy stuff. As a pastor, I want to teach you stuff and help you move from having a careless attitude to a heart that's ready to receive from the Spirit of God. Let, let me just tell you something, young people. If y'all would get this, I wish somebody would have just smacked me upside the face and said, listen to this. I would have saved myself and a bunch of other people a lot of harm and pain if I would have just listened. You get on some new parents. You more worried about them getting a bachelor's degree from Ole Miss, Mississippi State, LSU, whatever you are, than you are learning to teach them about to hear the things of the Spirit. All they're teaching them in half of these universities are lawlessness, and all they're teaching half of that stuff going on in universities, oh, it's okay to do this and okay to do that. They're teaching, they're, they're brainwashing your children. But buddy, if they would ever learn by the Spirit of God, they would be able to determine for themselves the junk they're hearing is not right. And let me tell you something, parents, I, I want my kids to have degrees. I told them you're going to get degrees, but you know what? I want them to have the Spirit of God as they went in and flowed and moved in these things. And that's where some of you need to be. And every time you come here parents I'm going to put it in your ear about those things in the name of the Lord amen all righty first Corinthians 12 7 we ain't going to be here long first Corinthians 12 7 through 11 says but the manifestations of the spirit is given to each one for profit so when the spirit of God begins to move in a church service you know how it is we're singing and all of a sudden you can begin to see the atmosphere begin to change you begin to sense something when the Holy Spirit begins to do that he's going to bring profit to the body of Christ and he does that by bringing exhortation, encouragement, and comfort. That's what the scripture says. So when the Holy Spirit begins to move, you don't got to be fearful for him, from him. I know in the past some of the churches made you afraid for anything to happen. But you don't have to be afraid. Because when he come, he's just going to encourage you. When he come, he's just going to bring comfort to you. You may be struggling, but hallelujah, somebody walks up to you and said, the Holy Spirit just told me to tell you that he's got nothing but good for you, and he's got a plan for your life, amen? And he didn't know you from Adam, or she didn't know you from Adam. That is what the Holy Spirit wants to do for your life, amen? So he wants to bring profit. For to one, everybody say one. Say, I want to be. I want to be the one. 
You're the, you can be the one if you have ears to hear. For to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gift of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit worketh all these things. Look at me. Distributing to each one individually as he wills. I have faith, but I don't always operate in the gift of faith. I speak in tongues all the time, but I don't always operate in the giving a message of tongues for the, the body of Christ. So y'all got me? So let's zero in real quickly. We won't be long. Let's zero in real quickly on what the deal is with the word gifts. Okay, you got my definition. When he talks about the word gifts up there, what does the word gift mean? A gift of the Holy Spirit. The word gifts means, we got it up there? Gifts is extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve the body of Christ. The reception of which is due or the ability which is due by the power of the power of divine grace Ability operating, look at it. Now, I want you to get this. When the Holy Spirit begins to operate, he's got to operate through your soul. If your soul is crazy, then he ain't going to be able to operate through you, or when he operates through you, it's going to sound a little crazy. What do I mean? It's like drinking water out of a water hose. How many of you drink water out of a water hose? I know y'all get this Dasani bottles and stuff, but us old folks picked up the water hose, and if you ever didn't think long enough, you took a big old sip before the water hose cooled down. You know what's happening? It was water, wasn't it? But it was hot, wasn't it? It was water, wasn't it? But it tasted like the water hose. And what's happening is a lot of us, when it comes to the moving of the Holy Spirit in our life, the Holy Spirit's working through us, but it gets a little bit of us. And what we want to learn to do is get to the place where the Holy Spirit can work through us, work through our souls, but people get pureness of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. So God wants to give you that gift of what? Of healing. So let's look at this. If you don't mind, put the healings on it. Because I think this is, if you don't mind, put the definition. This is where people have gotten mixed up in the Pentecostal charismatic church, okay? We're going to talk about the difference in gift of healings and working of miracles. People all over the world have went to see the different faith preachers, and I've been with them. I've sit and eat lunch with them. R.W. Sandbox, Benny Hens. All of, I've sit in the tables and asked them questions. I get it. But you know what? They were only a person being able to be used. And we started seeking the person to go be used by instead of get, learning to be able to allow the Holy Spirit of God to flow through us. Come on, y'all hang on me. So what does healings mean? I want you to help, help you understand. The word healings means a mode of healing or a remedy. How many of y'all was a kid that ever said something happened to you and your mama say, I got a remedy for that? If you burned your eyes out, what'd they do? Cut up some baked, uh, cut up some potatoes and put them on your fire. Oh yeah, that was a remedy. I remember my I burnt my eyes well one day, and Mama cut up them potatoes, and I was still two hours later saying, "Oh, I'd get these things off of me." Now I'm gonna tell you another one. Some of your country folks will realize, but back in Louisiana, we got what you call bull nettles. Anybody know what a bull nettle is? I don't know. What do y'all call bull nettles, Lila? What? Thistles. We call them boiled nettles. They call them thistles. Well, if you ever was running through the field and hit one of them, it would sting your legs. I'm talking burn, send chills all the way up here. You know what the remedy in Louisiana for that was? Pee on, Pee on them. <laughs> well, how many know some remedies you just don't want? I'd be like, nah, just let it burn. You ain't peeing on my leg. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm glad you said that. I ain't the one that looked vulgar and mean there. You the one that did that, all right? So look at me. So these old remedies, you know what I'm talking about? How many of you got a stee, uh, got bit by a bee, what would they do? What was the old remedy? Take old tobacco right out of their mouth and, uh, or a cigarette, you know, cut up that cigarette and stay. So remedy. So when it talks about the gift of healings here, it's a remedy or a mold. There's the working of miracles, but then there is a remedy. So let's take a quick run through and let's look at some different remedies. In other words, the gift of, uh, of healings, God does it in different ways. And we've been trying to get God to do 
healing in all the exact same way. You know what I'm talking about. If you're not feeling good, drag him to the preacher. My Lord, I just got finished arguing with my wife. My kids are acting crazy and you want me to lay hands on you and heal you. It's one of those, touch them in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? You know, y'all been there. Don't act like y'all hadn't been there. You know what I'm saying? But look at me. It's time for some of us to stop dragging them to the preacher and start believing God to operate through you. You know what I'm saying? But so that's what we need to do. Let's keep on going though, okay? So notice the word healings there is plural form. Got me? It's plurality there. So number one, the gift of healings may work in different ways because people are at different stages of faith or unbelief in their life. What God might do for this person that has a little bit of unbelief might be totally different than what God does for this person who is full of faith. I've had a lot of unbelief in my life. When I had my heart attack, I said, oh, give me to a doctor, Brandon. You pray all you want to, but give me to a doctor now. Jesus, take the wheel. You know what I'm saying? And, and so look at me. All of us get in different places in our life. And hallelujah, that don't mean you're unspiritual. That just means in a present time in your life, a little bit of unbelief has slipped in. But guess what? You know what? Thank God for people around you that that supernatural conviction begins to rise up and say, you shall live and not die, glory to God. And that is what we got to begin to have people working and flowing through us. So let's look real quickly at some different modes. Let's look at it. Mark chapter chapter 7, 32 through 36. Now, if I was to do this right here, y'all would knock me between the eyes. If you brought your wife and I begin to say I was going to do this, the husband would say, let's get at her. Dear. This man is crazy. But this is Jesus. Look what he said. And they brought him, one who was deaf and had an imp impediment in speech, and they begged him to put his hands on him, lay hands on him. And he took him aside, took him away from the multitudes, and put his finger in his ear. Now, you know, you know, Lord, I see these people on TV, you know, and then he reached down, look at me, and spat and touched his tongue. This is the mode. Now, the problem is, if you ever been to a church and they reached down and stuck his finger in your spit, that every one of y'all would be going to that church service to that same mode. Oh, I've seen a miracle there. That's the only way it happened. So, boy, you get in a miracle, need to need you. I'm going to that church that spits in your ear and spits on your tongue and all that stuff. I heard there that place can do it. But look at me. That was just a mode that Jesus did. That was a remedy did. And when it talks about the gift of healings, that's what it's doing. God is doing something to maybe increase that person's faith. Let's keep on reading it. And he took, he took him aside from the multitude and put his finger in his ear and he spat and touched his tongue. That's almost crazy nowadays, all right? Like, I'm sorry, Lord, but we were taking communion in Louisiana one time and it's like, these bright ideas come up with this stuff. We're going to take this piece of bread and all dip it into the same cup. And I'm like, I have counseled that guy. He has HIV. I am not, I know got AIDS. I am not dipping my bread in that cup. Sorry. So I ate my bread without the juice and believed in Jesus' name. Was all right. We've seen some stuff in 30 years, haven't we? That right there with that young girl, that was nothing. That's, I'm... Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, I guess, how, how would y'all pronounce that? F F Patha. Epitha, that's a good one. That is, be open. So look at me. That was the mode that Jesus did. Stuck an ear, fit on tongue, touch the tongue, boom, healed. All right, let's look at a, another mode, okay? There are many reasons for sickness. Let's look at this right here. Mark chapter 9, verses 25 through 29. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. Uh-oh, now we're talking about a little bit different stuff here. To a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsing him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one deaf, excuse me, as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind... 
or this particular mode, look at it right here. Y'all be careful over young bucks. I'd hate to come break your legs over. This kind or this mode came, come, uh, these came out by nothing but prayer and fasting. That's a different mode. And we, we chase different healings, and God does things a little bit different with all of us. See, some people have faith to operate in certain areas of healings. Therefore, the Holy Spirit uses them in particular areas. In other words, if God, let's say, let's say it right here. God wanted to touch my wife. And he's, the Holy Spirit's moving through the people trying to find somebody to use. And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to pray for your wife. And I'm like, man, no, man, we had arguments this morning. I can't do that. So the Holy Spirit comes over and like, oh, man, I can't do that. That's the pastor's wife. So the Holy Spirit comes, oh, I ain't going to do that. You know what I'm saying? I don't think she really likes me. So the Holy Spirit's trying to work through people. Holy Spirit's trying to work through different people. And he finally finds somebody to work. You said I'm getting there. The danger would be what would be sad is if somebody sit in the church service and the Holy Spirit couldn't find nobody to use. That would be tough, wouldn't it? And by the way, this is what I have found. Some of us self-righteous folks are too self-righteous to be used and he'll find some Reg neck, half crazed person over here to say, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm just, I'll do it. They scared to death. Oh, Lord, I don't know if this is you or not. I don't know if it's you. I'm going to pray. Oh, Jesus. That's what he wants to do. We need to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us, okay? Look at this right here. Hebrews chapter 11 says right here. Now, faith is the substance hope for. The evidence things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made, made of things which are visible. Everybody quotes that, thinks he's talking about the creation of Genesis. That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the elders obtained a good report. Why? Because God spoke to them and they did. The word worlds there means eons of time. By faith, all of those Old Testament saints were able to change their time period by a word. God speaks to them and they were able to change their generation. I believe God has spoken to Hosanna and I know he's spoken to me and said, you can change the environment in this area by faith and some of y'all are a product of prayer and intercession that God will bring you in but I don't want you to just come here and sit in the pews I want you to begin to be some of those people that are used that we can change our world but it's done by things we're not seeing it's not not something that we naturally operate all right let's keep on going we're beginning to wind down all right let's look at another one and then he says back in verse 9, that was the gift of healing. So there's different modes by which God does stuff. He, he may get you to put something in the ear. Probably not a lot nowadays because in America they would probably shoot you if you're doing that. And that South Africa, overseas, you can do that kind of stuff. Folks getting healed left and right. It's only in America where we have so much unbelief. Do you know that Jesus is appearing to whole Muslim countries, whole, excuse me, not countries, whole Muslim groups of people, hundreds of Muslims are getting saved left and right? Verse 9 says, to another by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles. So real quickly, the word working means an action, effect, or purpose. Remember, God gives moves upon a person for a supernatural thing, but he does it for a particular action or for a particular person. The working of miracles isn't just a physical thing. The working of miracles is when God supersedes the law of natural ability to create something that you couldn't have done on your own. Y'all get that? Yeah. It's when a tornado is heading your way and you declare that thing to go somewhere else and the natural law would be it's heading in this path. But glory to God, because faith just rises up with you, that tornado turns and heads that way. 
It's when God supersedes the natural law of things and begin to do things in great power. And the word miracle means active power inherit a building. In other words, God gives the supernatural power to work and change things. Listen right here. It is a demonstration of God's power and authority working outside the laws of nature. If you study it, it means an explosion of God almightiness. A lot of y'all know my wife, had, I used to have to take my wife and drag her to the hospital because she had migraines. And she would be vomiting the migraines so bad. In one day in a little church in Arkansas, smaller than our stage, just sitting there, we just praise and worship the Lord because we're going to serve God whether he heals or don't heal, right? And all of, a God, all of a sudden, you just talk to her about it, all of a sudden, supernaturally, God, from head to toe, done it, and she hadn't had it since. And look at me. I don't know why. I don't know the different modes of healing, but God can come in and supernaturally do stuff. He's done it. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, he's done these things, and I've seen it. And the reason why, why don't you throw them on TV? I think this should be kind of a normal thing. See, there's a difference in receiving a miracle than working a miracle. She received a miracle. It's another thing when the Holy Spirit moves upon you and works through you to do a miracle. And God wants to do that. Now, I got finished with that and I knew half of y'all would be sitting here saying, well, why then? Why this? Why? Why? You know the number one questions from people out in the world, they want to know why suffering and pain. Church needs to figure out the answer for that. That's the number one question heathen out there want to know why. And we need to stop long enough to say, you know what, I know you believe and have faith, but you need to stop long enough to say, how can I give an answer to these type of people? If all this is true, then why do we not see more miracles? Let's read, let me read this. This come out of psychology today, okay? Believing in miracles, this is a whole paragraph here. Believing in miracles is somewhat common. Holding these beliefs is not limited to a certain age of people, nor is it restricted to a certain religious denomination or religious affiliation. In 2007, a study surveyed of almost 36,000 Americans ages 18 through 70 plus years old found that 78% of people under the age of 30 believe in miracles. 79% among those older, uh, older than 30 few research did not believe in miracles. With respect to re religious affiliation, 80 83% of those who were affiliated, uh, 83 who were affiliated, believed that miracles in, con in believed in miracles. In contrast to 55% of those respondents who were unaffiliated. In other words, folks who b are believe in a religious organization or attend church regularly, 80 something percent of those people believe that God can do a miracle. Look, I, we go work in the past with chaplains and stuff, and they'll tell you, buddy, folks that enter in the hospital, if they got a more positive attitude and a better attitude, seem to heal quicker. And buddy, if you can just have a better attitude and heal quicker, you can't tell me that God can't come in and do a supernatural miracle, okay? Let's keep on going. Let me read that. Although people from all religions believe in miracles, over 80% of those with Protestant and Catholic affiliations endorse this belief. Even physicians, even physicians believe in miracles. In a national poll of 1,100 physicians from different religious faiths, these physicians were asked whether they believe in miracles. 74% believe miracles occur in the past, and 73% believe that miracles occur today. This is doctors. So if all this is true, let's just get to the nuts and bolts real quickly. If all this is true, then why we don't see more miracles? Let me just stop here and say, in foreign countries where they can't take a Tylenol for every little ache and pain, 
there's miracles taking place for those who believe. Just this. So number one, th these are, Brother Damon's just opinion here. Number one reason why I don't think we see more miracles, I only got three and they're going to be short, okay? I believe number one, there's a famine of the word which results in unbelief and carelessness. I believe there's a famine in being taught what, I just, what I'm trying to teach you all. People are starving and they don't even know, they don't even know, they don't even know that you can do these things or believe for these things. There's a famine. People are starving for truth. And listen to me, I'm all for blinking lights, guitars rocking and rolling and have a good one. But at the end of the day, I can't take them with me. At the end of the day, it is the word that I have sown in my heart. It is the word that I've looked towards instead of become careless-minded about. It's that word in me that has kept me stable and stuff throughout the years. Amos 8, 11 said because, because they wouldn't listen to the prophets, he stopped speaking through them. And as a result, there was a famine. God didn't stop doing anything. The problem was when God would speak the word to the people, they refused to listen to the prophets. So God said, okay. Then I ain't going to ask them to speak no more. If when I speak, y'all ain't going to listen, then I ain't going to ask them to speak no more. And as a result, there become a famine. And as a result of the famine, if you read the very next scriptures, they begin to long for it. And that is what I believe is going on in our society today. Young people, I believe in the book of Acts and in the book of Joel when God prophesied that your sons and daughters would prophesy. I believe it's happening in y'all. I believe y'all have sit and watched your parents act slap fools through the years. And you're beginning to be hungry for that stirring of the Word of God again. You're beginning to say, God, it's either truth or it's a lie. And I believe that in the midst of craziness, I believe that's what's starting to happen with people all over the world now. I believe people are beginning to say, speak God again. Speak God. We live in a dry and thirsty land. Speak, God. And he's taking crazy folks like this guy and crazy folks like this guy and crazy folks like this guy. And see, everybody wants to look at them and talk about what they used to be. It don't matter what they used to be. It determines right now, do they have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit of God Years ago, teachers come, oh, yeah, I ain't worth a plug nickel. That boy, you need to get that boy away. Them folks ain't even in church no more. Well, guess what? All these years later, they stay in the house of God. They're back there working with children on Wednesday nights and Sunday. That's what it's about. And look at me. God wants to do that work in your life. And you, I think that you cheerleaders, but y'all are cheerleaders. You Sunday school teachers and all that. You worship team, you people doing the work of the ministry, that's what's going on in people's life. So, number one, I believe a famine of the word. And because we've chosen not to listen to what the scripture teaches, we, God said, okay, when it comes to the supernatural things, I'll cut out. Number two, listen right here. God values relationships. I want you to get this. God values relationships. But for relationships to be meaningful, it must be freely chosen. It ain't like the dolls where you pull a string and it says, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You hear me? God desires a relationship, so for a, tr a true relationship to be meaningful, it's got to be something that you choose and we make a choice in doing. You know that in your own marriage. For relationships to be freely chosen, there must be a possibility of being rejected. And wherever there's a possibility of rejecting relationships, there's always a possibility of pain and suffering. God wants a relationship. To have a relationship, it's going to take a choice on your part to whether or not you're going to have that relationship with him. In doing that, God knew that some of you would reject that relationship within him, with him. And God also knew that when we reject that relationship, pain and suffering begins to happen in our lives. Because I rejected his word, I rejected his principles. 
and because of that, he knew suffering pain. So the next question would be, if God knew we were going to reject him, why did he create us in the first place? Look at me. My dad died about 10 years ago. My dad, he was the guy I could call and say, what do you think about this? I've been gone from him for 25 years, but I could call him and say, hey, what, how do you think I ought to build this sub panel? Do we need to bring 220 and 208? I need to jump up to 340 here and bring transformers in. He's the person you could talk to. And when he died, I could have said, oh, it makes me mad. Or I can say I was grateful for the 45 years that I got to spend with my dad. And see, some of you are mad at God for some of the things that happened in your life instead of looking and saying, you know what, I was just grateful that I got to spend that much time. Like your children. Before you had children, you knew there was a chance that they may grow up not like you. You knew that they were going to grow up and poo-poo in diapers. Sir, you knew that too, so take a part. I did a couple of times, I think. But in deciding to have children, you knew there'd be a chance that they may reject you and grow up and not like you. And you had children anyway, didn't you? Well, God knew that some people would reject his word. God knew some bad things wouldn't happen, so he was at a place. Do I not have any? And God chose to have it. He provided a perfect sacrifice for us through the person of Jesus Christ. He knew Adam and Eve were going to blow it. That's how come he come walking in the coolness of the dark. That's how come he went and provided a sacrifice and clothed them when they didn't even know how to clothe themselves. God knew it. But from the very beginning, there was this lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And we just got to choose to accept that. We just got to choose to accept that. I've got to choose to be grateful for what I do have instead of being mad at what I don't have. I got good memories with my daddy. I, I remember I, I'd get ready to go out. He'd always sit in that chair and he'd say, come here, son. And I'd have my girlfriend there, probably Brandy and stuff, and he'd say, Brandy said, no, it wasn't me. It was one of my girlfriends. <laughs> How many of y'all ever been there? All right, all right. <laughs> anyway, and it always make me kiss him on the cheek before he give me money to go out on a date. Oh, Dad, I want it. Son, you ain't going to get this $20 bill unless you kiss me on the cheek in front of her. You see what I'm saying? That, that was my dad. My daddy was just those type of people. And we argued and fought a lot, too. I'm probably a preacher today because I couldn't work for him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but anyway, I could have said, my daddy was just crazy. I couldn't work for him. I hate my daddy. Oh, but I thank God for my daddy for all that other good stuff. You know what I'm saying? And that's how God feels about you. He's seen some mistakes you made. He sees some stuff, but he still says, I want to create them. I want to make them, knowing that some of them will reject me. But there's going to be a whole lot that won't reject me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today, as I say, give the Lord a big hand clap. Go ahead. Look at me. If you hear, you just been, why, 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 why has this happened to me? I maybe try to get you some more answers, but you, the very fact that you're asking those questions means something inside you believe that there is a God. So the question then no longer is there's a God. The question you need to stop trying to get mad at God and say, God, help me to understand this. The very fact that you're angry, there's something inside you. There is a God, or you wouldn't. You say, God, I don't understand. It's been a lot of heart and pain. I don't understand what's went on. I don't understand why life turned out this way. But this is what I'm learning, that you can take everything and turn it around. There ain't a circumstance you've been through in life that God can't take it and do his thing and turn it around for the glory of God. There's no pain that you've ever been through, nothing that God can't take and turn it around. 
You just got to be willing. In Jesus' name.